Hey guys, welcome back to the Building Forms Workshop where we have finished the dry vault. I feel a lot better now. Quickly, before we get into proving that this is in fact the highest performance tool shed in the world, uh, I wanna give a few thanks of people who have helped us plan out this high performance homestead so far and we're gonna require a lot more help before we build this house that's gonna be awesome. So I hope you subscribe and stay tuned for that. Uh, first of all, Lou Harriman from Mason Grant Consulting. He is a dehumidification expert known the world over. Super nice guy. If you ever get a chance to meet him, he came up with this idea with me of how to get this, this uh, structure together. So basically, I took something that my dad has, which is a conditioned workshop, something my uncle has, which is an unconditioned outside workshop, and I was like, I want both. I want to be able to protect my tools, but not have to condition it and worry about air conditioning and all that stuff. Uh, so this is what you're about to see. Also on the list, Chris Lommergiddens from LG Squared Architecture and Adam Cohen from Structures Design Build. Both of those people are helping us to move forward with the homestead. And of course, everybody at Roxel and Ken and John on the team at 475 High Performance Building Display. This is the stuff that's inside here. Right now, outside, we're looking at 63.29 degrees and 64.9% relative humidity. This is the environment that this dry vault is existing inside of. Now we're gonna go inside in just a second and see what it's like in there. But uh, short story is, it's been a huge success. It works exactly as I hoped it would. And I can prove now with the testing that we're about to show you that this place actually does exactly what I built it to do. So. These are our doors. They're basically moving walls. You can see that I've got a padlock system up here. I've got handles, which are important, and I've got the locks that go into the concrete here. Now this, super airtight. Uh, that's what you want is you don't want the door to rattle at all. So when I want to open it, all I have to do is, ah, and it's perfect. Now we've got set up inside already the infrared camera. So why don't we come close and I'll show you what's going on with the infrared. Inside the dry vault, we have 68 degrees and 50% relative humidity. The 50% is maintained by that dehumidifier in the corner, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But the fact that these numbers are different at all is an indication to us that this room is working because there's no reason aside from the air sealing and the insulation and the machine that's only in charge of raising and lowering the humidity uh, that this room would do anything. Now, if it was not airtight and it wasn't insulated properly, even if you had the best insulation in the world that came out of the factory, if you didn't put it in here properly, it would not do this. So this, on a very mild day when it's 62 outside, the fact that it's different in here at all is a big deal. Now, when Lou and I were talking about the design of this place, uh, he suggested a desiccant dehumidifier, which is what we ended up going with. A desiccant dehumidifier is different than the normal dehumidifier that you just get if you went to any big box store and said, I want a dehumidifier. Desiccant dehumidifier works on a desiccant technology, which I am not a dehumidification expert. That's why I work with Lou Harriman. Uh, but it works all the way down to cold temperatures. A normal dehumidifier will not dehumidify air that's colder than you know 40 degrees, something like that. So if it's 30 degrees in here and it's snowing outside, that's 100% relative humidity. And I can actually make this thing dry out air that's cold, which is kind of an impressive thing. I want the tools in here to stay dry. So. Now that I have this desiccant dehumidifier, which by the way, does produce a little bit of heat, which you might think is why the room is warmer, but I wanna show you these graphs. These are from the Hobo data loggers that I am using to track the outside temperature and humidity and the inside temperature and humidity. And you can see that where the outside temperature has been phasing up and down for when the sun comes out and when it's nighttime, humidity has changed. It maybe rained one day and didn't rain the next day. Inside the room, you can see that once we started up the dehumidifier at the very beginning of the graph, as we move to the right, it really stabilized. And you can see that when the dehumidifier turns on, temperature rises a little bit, but then it turns back off. So this thing is actually not heating this space. It's a side effect, which is nice in the wintertime, not so nice in the summertime, because that's when I'm really wanting it to do the hard work. So it will be actually a little bit warmer in here than on a nice cool 70 degree day, because its job is not to keep this room conditioned, it's to keep it dry. This is our FLIR T660. Now you have a really nice expensive infrared camera for days like this and for situations like this. This room is only four degrees different than outside. And we just came out of nighttime. We're only in the first couple hours of the day. And there's all kinds of things about thermal capacitance and uh, the way that the sun works, et cetera, et cetera, that means that you should really know what you're doing before you pick up an infrared camera that is this sophisticated. The one that I carry around with me in my pocket generally, uh, which is a FLIR 1, is very good at picking up easy to detect 
temperature gradients. But this one is gonna tell us all kinds of things about the very, very fine detail. So when you focus the T660, and I have it actually recording the video right now, you can see that you can in fact see the studs in the walls. And you can see the intersection of the wall and the ceiling. Now a rookie mistake would be to say that those lines are bad. That's not actually true. All corners look like this. There's a whole bunch of things about how the way that air moves and circulates inside the room and that it doesn't get all the way into the corners there and about the way that the materials come together, that that I'm not worried about at all. That, uh, that's a good thing actually. Uh, so the fact that we can see that every cavity is exactly the same and every stud relationship to the cavity is the same is what we wanna see. Now we've got warm cavities, cooler studs, and that's because heat is leaving this room. It's warmer inside than it is outside. So I would scan the entire enclosure and you can see that even at the floor level, we have really no escape of heat in kind of a way that we would worry about, ooh, this area or that area. This is what you do before you run the blower door. Now, once I start running the blower door, this, image might look totally different. And that's because once air leakage is introduced into the equation, then this is going to become a totally different picture. And I will actually never get back to this picture within the next hour or two. So if I wanna know what just the insulation is doing on its own, I have to do it before I run the blower door. So now let's set up that RetroTech 5000. So magically, this dry vault is about the same volume and the same surface area as the Tiny Lab. And the Tiny Lab was passive house airtight. We uh, did a whole bunch of extra stuff with the Tiny Lab because we were gonna expose it to an earthquake and a hurricane at the same time. If you wanna see what we did with that, go watch that playlist on our YouTube channel. So this is called the highest performance tool shed in the universe, the way that I've been branding it on this YouTube channel. And let's find out exactly what I did. So we get our pressure up to 50 pascals on our RetroTech 5000. Now this thing can go down to like less than one CFM, which would be a dream. That would be Coke bottle tight. It's probably not gonna do that. So let's find out what we are gonna get. And it looks like we're coming in at 170 CFM at 50 pascals. Now that's what we test every single house and structure to. Commercial buildings are a little different. You go to higher pressure, but here, this is higher than I would have thought, actually. So let's just check this out. The air changes per hour that we're getting here is 4.4. That's a lot higher than I was hoping for. CFM per 100 square feet is 14.8. Both of those numbers are much higher than I would have thought. But this is where the butt comes in. I can still call this the highest performance tool shed in the universe because the fact is that nobody else has tested their tool sheds. So we're not competing on the same level playing field. I have all the numbers. And so if you have a tool shed that's better, please post a video and let me know about it. I will make sure that the world knows because this measuring where everybody has the same numbers is incredibly important. That is what's gonna change this entire construction industry. I have numbers that say that I did a better job with this tool shed than anyone else in the universe. And until somebody else has numbers, they can't talk to me about it, they can't argue. So please get those numbers for yourself. Now I, for myself, wanna find out what exactly is going on inside of this tool shed that is requiring so much air to be moving through this fan. That should not have happened. I'm gonna tell you right now that the few things that it could be, number one, uh, I used a nail gun in this scenario. I definitely did not hit all of the studs. So that means that there are nails that are going through my air tightness layer, the Solitex Mento, and also probably the Intello on the, this side of it, uh, that are just puncturing and are not providing then a seal, a pressurized seal. We use screws on the Tiny Lab. The other thing is we glued and screwed the plywood over there. Uh, also, we had the ability to, um, the seal at the bottom was probably a much more hardcore seal. Here, as you saw in the last couple of videos, we attached it to the cement, and I've never done that before, so I'm somewhat confident that that worked, but also, I don't, I don't actually know. So now, let's check out with infrared, while the blower is running, where our air leakage points are. Now I'm inside. What I'm going to do is uh, have to be in here while this is running on depressurization mode so that I'm blowing air out of the room. 
so that air is sneaking in to all of the gaps and cracks that I apparently didn't hit. Uh, now, you had seen that the door is taped off here because I don't want to punish myself for the fact that my weather stripping is going to be futzed with for the next several weeks because I'm a perfectionist, so I'm going to be messing around. So uh, let's go ahead and run this infrared and find out what's going on. You please hit set. All right, so I'm looking through this FLIR T660, very sophisticated, very sensitive camera. And honestly, I can't see <laughs> where this air leakage might be coming from. Um, it is pitch dark in this room with only the room that the light that's coming through the blower door shroud. So it wouldn't make any sense for you guys to see what's going on in here anyway that's not infrared. But what I can tell is that, by the way, that's my power strip um, for the electricity that's coming in here. What I can tell is that my door weather stripping, even though I've taped it off and where the blower door is sealing in, those are my major problems. So in fact, I might get a better number if I futz around with this weather stripping long enough. So if I have an update on this, I am definitely going to post it and let everybody know. But in the meantime, just understand that this blower door is out to four feet wide almost. It only goes out to about 42 inches or something like that. Um, so I'm having to really try and make this thing work uh, in a way that it's not used to working. Normal house doors are not anywhere near this big. <sighs> so actually that's really good news. I'm very happy that uh, all of the leakage seems to be with this horrible uh, jerry-rigged testing setup that I did, the guy who wrote the book on testing. So please don't do what I did, do what I say in my book. Uh, in the meantime, I will try and get this weather stripping dialed in and I'll try to get you guys an update video or at least a blog post on what actually it turned out to be. But in the meantime, I hope that this has been very educational for you and that you've enjoyed seeing how all of this worked. Please tune in, please subscribe, please comment. If you didn't like anything that I did, if you liked anything that I did, let me know. I'm, I'm a normal guy like you. I have my cell phone number on my website. Tune in next time.